Hallelujah. Before we move, shall we pray? <coughs> Loving Heavenly Father, we come before you. Oh Lord, you asked us to love one another. Lord, you came near to us. You crossed the great distance. Oh Lord, from heaven you came to earth. Oh holy God, you came and dwelt with us who are unholy. Oh great and powerful God, you came and dwelt with us who are powerless. And Lord, thank you that you have given to us the great uh, message. And you, you, were, you demonstrated that to us. Demonstrated your love to us. Thank you, Lord. Help us. Today, as we look to learn from the book of Revelation, I pray, O oh Lord, that may you help the people. May you help me to help the people. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I was so glad when uh, a young boy met me today morning and said, Uncle, you're, you're going to teach from the book of Revelation, isn't it? Oh. I said, wow, at least one guy is waiting for that. So, praise God. Hallelujah. And uh, a few weeks back, Brother John Alex, he came and talked to us from the book of Revelation. And uh, that was good in the sense uh, quite a few of us were helped. And uh, they were interested in reading the book of Revelation. For example, in our live group, quite a few people read through the book of Revelation. And, uh, uh, but yet, I felt that it will be good uh, that if the church has one more, uh, you know, teaching from the book of Revelation. Of course, the book of Revelation we can teach for months uh, from that book. So my aim is not to teach the book of Revelation, which, of course, it is not <laughs> possible in <laughs> one or two messages. But I want to give you helps for studying the book of Revelation. Helps for studying the book of Revelation. Now, what comes to mind when the book of Revelation is mentioned? If you mention the book of Revelation to any Christian, what comes to mind? They will say, it's about the end. Some people will say it's about the rapture. Some people will say it's about symbolic numbers, about four horsemen, about Antichrist, about 666, about judgment, about vengeance, the second coming of Jesus, new heaven, new earth. These are some of the words which come. Now, interestingly, two of the words which I just said is not even mentioned in the book of Revelation. Two of the words which I just mentioned, number one, rapture, number two, antichrist. Both of the words are not even there in the book of Revelation. Anyway, <clears throat> there are some other important words in the book of Revelation like witness, like throne, Lamb, you know, those are very important words, yeah? So, <clears throat> now the book of Revelation has drawn a lot of uh, reactions from even wonderful people of God. Some of you may know that Martin Luther <laughs> had a problem with the book of Revelation. He, he grouped it with James and few other New Testament books that he deemed inferior to gospel and uh, the letters of Paul. <laughs> It's the only book on uh, uh, of the New Testament which Calvin did not write a commentary for whatever reason. <clears throat> There's one famous person called Thomas Paine, American, who lived in the 18th century. He said something which I found it funny. <laughs> he said, Revelation is a book of riddles that requires a revelation to explain it. <laughs> so, you know, that's the, you know, these are the reactions when we uh, see the book of Revelation. <clears throat> now, there has been many irresponsible readings from the book of Revelation. G.K. Chesterton, who is a very famous, uh, you know, writer, he said, 
<laughs> which is a very apt comment, and I really liked it. Let me quote. He said, though Saint John, the evangelist, who wrote the book of Revelation, he saw many strange monsters in his vision. He saw no creature so wild as one of his own commentators. That means, commentators means those who comment on the book of Revelation. Some people are, they interpret Revelation so wildly, so badly. And G.K. Chesterton says that maybe even John did not see such wild and strange monsters like people who interpret Revelation in such bad ways. So that's the situation, you see. Revelation. There are many people who are not interested in Revelation because of some of these reasons. It's not clear. You know, we are confused. I don't know what to make of it. So many people don't read the book of Revelation. There are on the other extreme people who are so fixated on the book of Revelation as if that's the only book and they're every day pouring through the pages of newspapers to find who the 666 is and what is going to happen and Israel and temple and everything. So they are heavily into that. So <clears throat> the problem with Revelation and studying the book of Revelation has been an obsessive focus on the future end times. People think that God has put some thing in code language about future which we have to unravel and so there are some specialists also who teach from the book of revelation it's like you know we have orthopedics ent so revelation specialists like they are, they are specialists in revelation so they will say something and people are wanting to study from you know those things so but we have to understand that revelation contains many profound truths and encouragements concerning not just future but about Christian life and discipleship here. And please note the two statements which I am going to say now. Revelation is not primarily about Antichrist, it is about Christ. How many of you want to say amen to that? It's about Christ. Unfortunately, when we think of Revelation, we, we think, who's the Antichrist, where is he? It's primarily about Christ. Second, Revelation is not about a rapture out of this world, but it is about faithful discipleship in this world. How to live in this world when there are oppressive regimes. I, I was glad to hear Brother Glenn saying, you know, how to live that life of resistance. Against this world system. There is so many wonderful truths to be learned from the book of Revelation. I believe. Not just about the future timetable. <clears throat> so if somebody says, why read the book of Revelation? Well, Revelation is good news about Christ. It's about the Lamb of God who shares the throne of God. This Christ is a key to the past, to the present, and to the future. This book tells us that we must have uncompromising faithfulness while living in this world. Even in midst of unrelenting evil and oppressive empire and regimes. And this book gives undying hope for us who want to live in such times. Revelation is about Jesus Christ who is presented as number one. He is a faithful witness. He remained true to God despite tribulation. Jesus Christ is the one who walks among the churches, who comforts and challenges people through his spirit. Jesus Christ is a lamb who was slain and now reigns with God. 
and he is the coming one who will bring god's great purposes to fulfillment now if i ask first corinthians is what kind of a letter uh, sorry what kind of uh, literature you would say it is a letter it is a epistle if i ask you what kind of uh, uh, document is the book of mark you can say it is like a biography maybe yeah what kind of a document is the acts of apostle it is history what kind of a document is the book of revelation and that we have to you know i found something which is going to be very helpful to all of you we have to look at revelation as three different types of genre all in one you know number one it is a letter many many people they just overlook this fact why do i say or why is the book of revelation a letter it is written in a letter form <laughs> let's look at the book of revelation chapter 1 verses 4 verse 4 you know the in the, the letter form is you say to dash 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 and in the ends you say something yeah so can we see it here oh verse 4 john to the seven churches that are in asia grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and we find the ending chapter 22 revelation chapter 22 in the end you see the closing comments of this letter verse 10 he says he said to me do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is near yeah so the grace and he ends by saying verse 21 the grace of the lord jesus be with you be with all amen so this book of the book of revelation is a letter it is a, it was a circular letter it was written to seven churches which actually existed it's not like uh, some mythical <laughs> churches or some names which were made up or symbolic churches they were real churches there was a church at ephesus so all the seven churches are in the present day turkey asia minor so the the churches the order was also in a anti clockwise direction so a person who would go with this letter first he would go to ephesus then which is the second smyrna pergamum thyatira sardis philadelphia laodicea so it's like this it was th this letters these cities are written in a anti clockwise way i mean it's in a circular way we can look at in the map so anyone who reads the book of revelation once we realize that it is written in a letter form what does that show to us suppose i write a letter to sujit the very minimum thing is that sujit would understand it isn't it <laughs> it is not that i write a letter to sujit so that 2000 years later someone else can understand it that letter is primarily meant to you to your circumstance and for your encouragement for blessing you many people read the book of revelation as if it has nothing to do with the first century they are reading the book of revelation as if it's some kind of a code book which starts with the maybe creation of israel or something like that i mean as if the original readers had no understanding of any of this it's like you know they just got a let they just read a document no 
This was primarily to the seven churches. Now the problem is, inside this letter, there are letters. Many of us, we feel that chapter 2 and chapter 3 are letters to churches. But please understand that the whole book of Revelation is a letter inside which there are particular letters to particular churches. So imagine, I am writing a letter to all of you. And inside that letter, so I say to the church, the disciples, fellowship church like that, and inside that church, I may have specific message for someone and specific message for someone else and specific message for someone else. But the whole message is for all these seven churches. So it's very, very important that we must not forget that the book of Revelation is a letter. Frankly, this has really, this is one point which has really helped me to look at book of Revelation. Otherwise, we will be <laughs> misguided. We will go into some other direction. And we will just interpret the whole book of Revelation in whatever way we want. <clears throat> number two. What is the book of Revelation? Number one, it is a letter. Number two, it is an apocalyptic literature. What is apocalyptic literature? Apocalyptic literature is a kind of literature which was quite common in, uh, say, from 200 BC to 200 AD. You know, around 300, 400 years during those times, it was a very common kind of writing. What was special about that? In, because we don't read such books now, we are not familiar with that kind of a reading. The closest we can read to such kind of literature is say, highly symbolic literature is books like Lord of the Rings, etc., which will not qualify as apocalyptic literature, but kind of a symbolic kind of literature. Apocalyptic literature was a kind of literature in which a revelation is given by some supernatural being, especially angels or somebody, that understanding is given to a human person, and that understanding is some kind of a transcendent reality. That means some kind of a reality which we cannot know from our eyes. It's from the perspective of God about what's happening. And in that literature, they use heavy symbolism and heavy imagery. Those imageries should not be looked at as, you know, literal. If we look at that images as literal, again, we will go wrong. So, for example, uh, let me give you uh, some examples of that, yeah? Look at uh, chapter 9, verse 19. Chapter 9, verse 19. For example, I mean, there are too many examples here, but... Uh, <coughs> so there, there is this, the sixth trumpet... Verse 18 says, chapter 9, verse 18, the third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire and smoke and brimstone which proceeded out of their mouths, for the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents. So there's a horse, there's a tail. The tails are like serpents and have heads. And with them they do harm. You see, there are lots and lots of symbolic uh, things here. And uh, let's, let's look at chapter 17. Right. In chapter 17, 
there is this woman. You know, this woman is uh, said, chapter 17, verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So there is a woman who sits on seven mountains. So one uh, teacher of God's word from Bangalore, as he was teaching, he said, imagine this woman who sits on seven mountains. So either these mountains are so small that a woman can sit on it, or this woman, this, this is so big that she can sit on seven mountains. If we do not understand that this is highly symbolic language, and the city of seven hills is Rome, we are going to be completely thinking of one woman there. So, there are so many images like this. There is a whole city is flowing with the blood. Woman has some, this many stars, and there's another woman in chapter 12. By the way, this woman is a, one kind of woman. There's another woman in... Great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with sun. Now, with our mind, you tell me how a woman can be clothed with sun now. Literal sun. So don't think of literal sun. And the moon under her feet. And on her head a crown of twelve stars. So there is heavy symbolism, heavy imagery. This is a different kind of literature. If we read book of Revelation, just like any other book, and assign exact meaning, so you think of woman, you think of sun, clothed with sun, and moon is on her feet now. If we begin imagining like that, we can never come to any understanding. We will rather be confused. But we should understand, neither is John wanting us to understand it that way. <laughs> He is using a kind of literature which was available at that time and, you know, to communicate to us what he saw and what was shown to him, which he wrote down. Apostle John was shown certain things and then he wrote down these things. Very, very important. So this is apocalyptic literature. This is letter. And third, this is prophecy. Why I say this is prophecy? What is, why I say this is prophecy? Because it is written. Blessed is the person who, verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. So this is prophetic literature. Again, when people hear the word prophecy, Usually, what, we, what comes to mind? Future. But you, when we read the book of, uh, the Old Testament books, is everything about future? Book of Amos, you know, or any, any book, Isaiah, Jeremiah, there, is, there are things about future, but mostly it is about that time. This is another very important point. If you are noting down, even in your mind, please understand, when we say revelation is prophecy, don't think that it is only about future. <laughs> it was about that time also. Prophecy can be seen in two ways. Number one, forth telling, F-O-R-T-H, forth telling. That means... A person tells people things to them as they are in the sight of God. As their practices are, as their lives are in the sight of God. That is also called prophecy. Forth telling. 
And of course, there is foretelling also. F-O-R-E, foretelling. But even that foretelling is with a view to help these people. For example, people, they are in exile, they will be, so that they won't get this thing, they will say, no, no, you will be saved also. So that future is also not just for academic interest. It is for encouraging them. It, that has relevance to their lives. So, this is the one of the most important helps which I believe I can give to anyone who reads from the book of Revelation. To realize that it is a letter, it is apocalyptic literature, and it is prophecy. If we see John, by the way, who is this John? Is this Apostle John? Or some John? In this book, there is from, if you read only the book of Revelation, you would not get much clue as to whether it is Apostle John or some other John. But whatever it is, this John was a very major leader who was well known to the seven churches who had a kind of stature at that time amongst those people. And church history says that, you know, Polycarp was very close, close to John. So Polycarp's, you know, disciple, he said that this is from, this was written by John. So church history also says that this was written by John, the apostle. Okay? So, let us take that it was written by John the apostle. John the apostle writes this prophetic book of Revelation similar to some Old Testament prophets. Can you tell me? Uh, not the whole book of Daniel. Let, if you see some part of Daniel, it is like that. If you see Zechariah and if you see Ezekiel, he also used to see so many images like this and, you know, so many. It's that kind of writing. Even in the New Testament, Mark chapter 13 is a little bit written in this way. When Jesus says about what will happen in the end times and everything, you know. Let me move on. When was this book of Revelation written? And what was the time? What was the context at that time? Because any letter, if we have to understand, we must understand the context. If we read the book of Revelation, we will realize that there was some persecution going on at that time. But persecution was only scattered in chapter 2, verse 3, chapter 2, verse 13, chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, there are indications that there was some persecution happening. But that does not fit into the severe persecution which happened in history under Emperor Nero. So which means this must have happened after that because there was no severe persecution at that time. They were living in relative ease. If you read the book of... Uh, uh, I mean, the letter to Laodicea, it is written that yeah, so you think you are rich and you think you are they are reasonably well off rather. You think that you have need of nothing. <laughs> so, I don't want to go into too many details, but the time of revelation was a time when the people were under the Roman Empire. There was quite a bit of persecution, but the persecution had not become too much under Domitian. During that time, see, initially what happened was in Roman Empire, they had given some uh, uh, relief to the Jews. Jews, okay, the Romans, they didn't want to interfere too much with the Jewish people. They said, Tiga, you have whatever prayer and everything you have. But what happened, Roman Empire, towards as it progressed, they went on into emperor worship. That was their problem. They said, you better worship the emperor. 
now the christians were people who would not worship the emperor they were like shadrak meshak abednego nothing doing we cannot so as long as the initial days the christians were with the jews so they were protected but after some time jews began to say they are not our party you know so then the christians were focused for persecution and they had to go through a lot of persecution so the the temptation for the christians during those times was to go back to judaism because if they go back to judaism they are relatively safe from persecution so there was this emperor worship there was lot of progress and everything so you, you must understand the word babylon by the way the one very interesting thing is in the whole book of revelation we just written to people who were under rome the word rome is never used <laughs> the word used is babylon why do you think the word babylon is used and not rome because you see in the bible babylon is used babylon initially was the thing which god used to destroy the temple and this rome people in ad 70 they came and destroyed the jerusalem temple again please understand briefly those who don't know about the history of the temple the temple the first temple was built by solomon and that solomon to build the temple and everything but then these people of judah they did not follow the lord the lord sent so many prophets and then they did not uh, listen and finally god god said i will send uh, you know nebuchadnezzar i will send babylon and finally they came and they just destroyed in 586 bc it was not in one go over three waves of destruction was there and then 70 years later these people came back from exile and under the leadership of zerubbabel they rebuilt the temple but this temple was smaller compared to the previous temple then in the first century ad uh, you know first century during that time herod built the temple and that is the temple which was there in the time of jesus christ so the temple the cleansing of the temple and everything so that's that big temple that's the temple which took 46 years to build and lo and behold jesus came he died he rose again but jesus said not one stone will remain and that prophecy was true the romans came and brought jcb no okay jcb was not there but they just raised it to the ground so after so therefore the romans are also called babylon whoever fits the ba- babylon's cap is called babylon see this kind of imagery is used in the in the book of revelation you see if i the use of old testament in revelation in the book of revelation there are 404 verses is worth writing it down those are 404 verses okay out of this 278 verses contain some reference to old testament i calculated it comes to 69% <laughs> can you imagine that somebody writes a letter in which 69% is basically alluding to old testament it's not copy paste it's not fully it's not quotation but it is called allusion a l l u s i o n allusion what is the difference between quotation and allusion quotation means verbatim tack tack copy paste allusion means that thing is there in his mind and based on that he is talking about this you see that is why you would see that there are so many see in revelation chapter 1 verses 12 to 
we see that John saw the Son of Man. But that has a lot of similarities to what Daniel saw and what Isaiah spoke. There's a lot of allusions. Anybody who wants to understand the book of Revelation, if they're not good in the Old Testament, they may not find it that easy. So, 69% of the verses in Revelation contains references to Old Testament. Now, another statistic, which I found very interesting. In the whole book of Revelation, there are over 500 allusions to Old Testament text. Now, this is not verses, total number. So, in one verse, there can be more than one allusion. 500 allusions to Old Testament in the whole book of Revelation. In the whole letters of Paul, there are only 200. So, you can imagine how rich this one book is. It's bathed in soaked in from the Old Testament. Especially from the book of Daniel, Ezekiel. Even the judgments which are there, they are patterned on the Egyptian plagues. So, let me move on. How to interpret the book of Revelation? What are the different ways of interpreting the book of Revelation? Because, you see, some people, I, I will not go into so many technical terms, of theological terms, but just you understand, okay? So there's this book of Revelation. Some people say that, you know what, whatever John said, that was all about till AD 70. It is finished. All it was for those people. Everything is done. All you know the so the Babylon will fall means the Roman Empire will fall. Uh, you know everything is finished in that. So there will be a new thing and everything. Well, I don't think that can be taken. Although there are some of the prophecies which came true, but not all of this has come true, and. Uh, that view, that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it, again, which is not very great, but people say that, you know what, the whole book of Revelation, this is the whole book of history. That means the initial part was fulfilled in the first few centuries, and then the Middle Ages, and now we are living towards the end, 17, 18 chapter, something like that. So the successive church ages, it shows. That's called the historicist view. Well, that's also not a very great view. The third view is more common. That's where people think that the book of Revelation is about the future. Even our future. <laughs> okay? It is, they say that it is about the future. According to them, most of the things of book of Revelation is not done yet. In fact... Now, by the way, some of you may be thinking, uh, Brother Sunni, this is a Sunday morning. This is not a, some theology class. Why are you going into so much detail? The thing is, the book of Revelation is there in your Bible. You are anyway going to read it. And 99% uh, of you are not going to the theology colleges. So you need some help to read this book. Otherwise, at least you need some help to not read this book wrongly. That is my effort. Okay. My effort is not to make all of you some theology students or something. No. But my effort is that when you will hear, you already, all of, most of you have some view about book of Revelation. And most of it may not be even very good and understanding. Yeah? One of the most common things, ways people uh, interpret the book of Revelation is the dispensationalist view. Actually, that view, I'll tell you what that view is. That view says that the whole church time is divided into dispensations. God deals with particular people in particular time, in particular way. And we are now in the age of church. So what is going to happen is that by chapter 3, 
In chapter 4, the church is raptured. So everything else is future. So we are not part of that. We are not part of tribulation. We are not part of anything. Basically, most part of revelation is just some understanding for us of what will happen to other people, including Israel, not about us. Now, this view was popular. This view was not there till first 18 centuries in this world. This view was, came only in the 18th century by a person called J.N. Darby. And uh, Schofield Bible people popularized it. And then uh, there was this person called Hal Lindsey who wrote some books. And then there was this famous Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye. And that is what captured popular imagination. And most people, when they think of Revelation, they think that, oh, we are not there. I am driving car. Suddenly, I am not there. And then, you know, then what will happen? And all this Left Behind series. Well, this, there is not enough time for me to tell you now why I feel and so many wonderful people of God feel that that is a very not a good way of looking at the book of Revelation. Uh, the primary reason being this book was written to as a letter. It was not written to those first century people to tell them about what will happen now. From chapter 4 to chapter 21 is not written to them as if that has no relevance to them. It was written for them primarily, but it has implications for us. So that is another view uh, which, you know, uh, it's, not, it's a, not a very good way of looking at it. I would say, and the view which I found the best is something called eclectic view, E-C-L-E-T-I-C, -E which means something of everything. That means, in one sense, this is a highly symbolic book, which is which has timeless truths for every generation, number one. Number two, some of the prophecies were already fulfilled, so in that way, that way also something is good. Some of it is fulfilled in these generations, but a lot of it is future also, and it had relevance for the people there. So, how do we look at the book of Revelation is very important. <coughs> we find Revelation as a highly symbolic book. We should be careful to very much interpret it literally. We should interpret Revelation literally only when Apostle John tells us, yeah, this means, this seven lampstand means seven churches. Then we are sure. Otherwise, we should be a little bit careful about applying, yo, this means this, this uh, 666 means this. By the way, I don't know how many of you know, the word 666, which is there in the uh, book of Revelation, that referred at that time to Nero, N-E-R-O, Nero, Neron Kaiser. If you write Neron Kaiser, and there is a Hebrew way called gematria, G-E-M-A-T-R-I-A. That means the Hebrew letter, each letter has a mathematical number associated with it. When we add up the number, so for example, N has this much value, N-E-R-O-N, something like that in Hebrew. When we add that up, it comes to 666, okay? Now, does that mean that it has no future relevance? It may have a future relevance, but definitely that original 666 was about Nero. So that is, uh, that is quite clear to almost any Bible scholar uh, worth, you know, <laughs> who knows something about uh, Hebrew and uh, some of these things. If we see John uses lots and lots of symbolic numbers, which are some of the symbolic numbers he uses? Seven. So there is seven-fold spirit. What do you think? There are seven sp spirits there. Seven is a picture of completion. So seven-fold spirits of God. Then there is seven uh, seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. So that's showing completeness of God's ang uh, wrath, you know. So there are so many sevens. I have not noted down all these, but please understand. Then there is the number four, 
which was also used in Old Testament and other Jewish literature to show completeness. So there are these four rivers of Genesis. Uh, there is this four, Israel was divided into four groups in wilderness. Uh, in Revelation, it is used as four corners or four winds, you know. Then there is the number 12. The 12, there were 12 tribes. You know, there was a time when I was a teenager, I used to read the book of Revelation. I used to be so, so tense. The reason was that only 1,44,000 would be selected and I had to get through that entrance. So, oh my God, what will happen? Those of you who have read the book of Revelation uh, would understand what I am speaking about. From each tribe, 12,000. My God, only 1,44,000 will be saved. There are billions of people in this world. If I had read few verses ahead, it would have said that there is a number which no man can count from every tribe. That I didn't read at that time. The other thing is, does this mean that there is exactly 1,44,000? What is 1,44,000? There's some multiple of 12, isn't it? Huh? So, there is symbolic. There are 24 elders. Who are they? There are 12 tribes in the Old Testament, people of God, and 12 apostles in the New Testament. And the whole thing combined is the, representing the whole people of God. Numbers, you see. The, word, uh, the number 10 also, it shows completeness, as in 10 commandments, you know, there, there are so many uh, wonderful things. Now, if all of these things are symbolic, a question to you. Revelation 20 says that there will be 1,000 years. Why do you think that is a literal 1,000 years? All of the numbers before is mostly symbolic numbers. But so many people in this world, uh, in the Christian community, think that there is a literal 1,000. Some of you who are hearing me, you may not be agreeing with what I am saying. Don't fight with me. I love you. You love me. And, uh, you know, let's both follow the Lord, you know. <laughs> but uh, we should be a little bit open to understanding the, from the book of Revelation. Otherwise, what will happen is, there are people who are very set. This is how it is, okay? That's it. Okay, good. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. But uh, my only concern is not that you will not reach heaven. No, you are going to heaven is based on your trusting in Jesus Christ and as the Lord and Savior and you're walking with him. But you may not benefit from this book as much as you should have benefited. That's my only concern. Plus, if you understand things wrongly, don't think that it will have no effect on your life. You see, this book is a wonderful book uh, which has been given to the people of God across the ages. How we can stand even when there are oppressive regimes. How we can run counter to all of this. How even though there is this oppressive system, we don't need to be a part of that Babylon, that war, that harlot. Because that system is going to be destroyed. So be faithful even unto death. You may even die. By the way, Revelation doesn't give guarantee that people are not going to die. In fact, Revelation is continually exhorting the martyrs. Because the question comes from martyrs, how long, O oh Lord, how long? And the answer is, wait, wait. So many people have understood, I mean, they can quote from Revelation chapter 12, there's a verse, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony thank you for the rest part of the many people stop there <laughs> they overcame him by the blood of the lamb so we have blood blood rectum 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 jayam you know that is not some formula thing they overcame him by the blood of the lamb let's read that verse this is where you know the problem of uh, the calendar verses come in because in calendar, we cannot write the whole verses, you see, whole context. So we read half the verses and then, 
you know, we don't read the, <coughs> we don't get the whole thing. Verse 11. Chapter 12, verse 11. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their... What, do you, what is this word of their testimony? <laughs> word of their testimony is when people hold you by your collar and bring you and say, if you tell Jesus, we are going to kill you. And then they say, no, we trust in Jesus. Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. That's the testimony. Because the next line says, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. Dear brothers and sisters, that's how, you know, we win. Brother Glenn told in, the, in his short exhortation, you know, not being afraid of death, but standing against resistance. Hallelujah. So that's the kind of thing which this book of Revelation is written about. So that we can be encouraged. People of God will know that ultimately the evil will not triumph. Ultimately God will come. He will bring justice. There will be new heaven, new earth. And this should fill the present people, us, with hope. With encouragement to stand and not bow down, not compromise. There are people of God who say, the book of Revelation is resistance literature. How we can resist the empire. Now we are not under Roman empire, but still we are under the world system. And we shouldn't bow down to that, dear brothers and sisters. One question one or two questions I will just uh, quickly address and finish. Is the book of uh, Revelation a linear thing or non-linear thing? For example, when if you read the book carefully, you will suddenly realize, so there is this judgment coming, okay? How is this uh, book of Revelation, the outline? Chapter 1, the initial uh, vision about Jesus Christ. Chapter 2 and 3, the letters to the churches. Chapter 4 and 5, the great thing happening in heaven. So the scene shifts to heaven. How God is enthroned, chapter 4. And how the Lamb is also on the throne. From chapter 6 to chapter 20, it is about a series of visions which shows judgments. These judgments are divided into three parts. First is the seven seals. So as each seal is open, there is a series of things happening. But we will see that when you reach the sixth seal, we will not go to seventh seal. Suddenly the sixth seal, the first trumpet will start. Then the first trumpet starts, then there is the seventh, this thing. Then there will be bowels of judgment. And if you again look closely it's not that after the seals, there's trumpets, and after the trumpets, there is bowels. It seems to be a spiral one. <laughs> it seems to be that there is something called recapitulation. This doesn't mean that there is no progression, but there will be some kind of uh, increase. Initially, in the seals, one-fourth of the people die, like that it is written. When it comes to trumpets, one-third. So there is an intensifying of judgments. But please understand, it may not be exactly this. There is interludes in between. Do you think that Apostle John just wrote down, and okay, let me write a history in advance. No. He wrote in order of what he saw. Hello? There is a lot of difference between... John writing a series of revelation in the order he saw versus John writing the history in advance. I don't think he has written history in advance. He has written a series of revelations. Of course, it ends with the new heaven and the new earth. Some of you may say, brother, why do you think that God used such confusing ways to... <laughs> to to talk to us. He could have spoken in a little bit more clarity, you know? And that is where 
and I would like to quote two people. One person said, Flannery O'Connor, American short story writer and novelist. She was asked, in your novels, why do you create such bizarre characters? She replied, for the near blind, you have to draw very large, simple caricatures. <laughs> very thoughtful thing. For the near blind, you have to draw very large caricatures. We don't see much unless big things, things so grand are told, maybe some of us don't understand. Another person said that the prophets instruct our weak religious imagination by means of visual enhancement. You see, this question can be asked about to Jesus also. Why did you speak in parables? So that those who understand will understand and those who don't understand will not understand. He who has ears, let him hear. You know, when we discuss the book of Revelation in our life group, one of the members told, Brother Sunil, I feel this book of Revelation should be read by all unbelievers. You agree? Well, the book of Revelation was written to whom? The church. Hallelujah. So let us read them. The book of Revelation is written to the people of God. Why is it written about judgments to people of God? Two reasons. One, martyrs and those kind of people can feel that ultimately justice will be done. But there are people inside the churches, some of whom are following Jezebel, some of whom are following Balaam's teachings, sitting inside the church. This should act as a warning to them. Hello. Things are going to be, God is this kind of God. He is a merciful God. By the way, don't think that God is a, some very tyrant kind of person. He was killing only one third. Two third he was leaving behind. And the one verse which I found very haunting to me was a repeated line. Despite seeing all this, the people did not repent. Can we stand up, please? I do not think that all your doubts regarding Revelation is clarified today. Not at all. In fact, few new doubts may have come up after I spoke. But one thing I'm sure... Those of you who love the Lord and who want to move on with the Lord, definitely I believe the Lord would have given something to you today. Some interpretive key, some interest, some understanding and some encouragement to stand steadfast during the times of trouble, during this. Oh Lord, we come before you. Thank you for John who wrote this book. Thank you for your spirit who caused this book to be written. Oh Lord, in the past we have used it more like a, a, something of a game to predict when the world will end or who will be the Antichrist, etc. But oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Help us to appropriate words of life, words of hope, words of encouragement from this book. Oh Lord, you reign you are the God who is on the throne. And you reign. Lamb of God, you reign. We know that evil is real. We know that empire is real. We know, Lord, we are all tempted to idolatry. We are all tempted to immorality. But thank you, Lord, that you are calling us to be faithful to the covenant. You are calling us to resist Stand against the evil one, even if it is at the cost of our life. We know, Lord, that there is imminent judgment. We look forward, O oh Lord, for the salvation, for the complete salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the faithful witness. Hallelujah. We look forward to the new heavens and new earth. 
Hallelujah, in which righteousness dwells. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We give all glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen.